Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Helmets of the World. I'm Mike B and today we're going to be looking at one of my holy grails that I recently acquired and one of the most sought after helmets for collectors from World War II. This is going to be the Japanese Tetsubo or the Type 90 or M30-32. I know it's a lot of different names but uh, we'll kind of get into that a little bit. These helmets were designed in the late 1920s and began to be distributed in around 1930 and through 1932, but we'll explain why it's got the dual date on there a little bit. Um, it doesn't really explain why, it's just they chose to go with that because that's when they started doing experiments and distributing these. So before this, the Japanese had been experimenting with several designs that were patterned after the Japanese M1918 Adrian-style helmet, which I don't have. Those are rare as hen's teeth. I don't think I've ever seen one for sale. Someday, maybe. Uh, there were three models experimented with being designated models A, B, and C all of which were fielded in extremely small numbers during the invasion of Manchuria starting in 1931. Most Japanese soldiers at that time in Manchuria were still wearing the Model 1918 helmet, and they finally settled on the Model D, which is what you see here in front of you, and this became the Type 90 or M30-32. At first, between 1930 and 32, these were only seen in very small numbers with Japanese troops, and it wasn't really until about 1937 that the Type 90 became the standard for all branches of the Imperial Japanese military. So let's take a closer look at this beauty. Yes, I'm going to be wearing gloves for this one. This is an extremely expensive piece in my collection. I don't want to get my hand oils all over it, so it rusts. Um, that's why I'm wearing these. You can make fun of me later, but we'll explain how much these cost here in a little bit. So you'll notice that this is a flared edge and... Uh, it's got a flared edge on it, right? You can see that obviously right there. And it's kind of an oval shaped helmet. You can see this, it's it's not perfectly round like you'd expect to see from the front. So you've got kind of a, a longer oval shaped profile on the top. And you can see these vent holes on either side of the top of the shell, right there and there, and there and there. That's how it was ventilated. It doesn't have any big you know, vents like a lot of other helmets did. They're very small and it's very interesting. So. Um, the star insignia on the front does indicate that this helmet was used by the Army. The other branches, such as the Navy and the Marine Corps, or the Marines, I guess, they're not called the Corps. I guess maybe they are Japanese Marine Corps. Uh, the Navy had a, an anchor with a chrysanthemum and sometimes some words on there. And the Marine Corps would just have the um, standard anchor usually painted on on the front, and they had they didn't really have a little badge like that. But there was actually Navy badges that were made too, but usually on the Marine Corps ones, you're just gonna see the, the paint on the front of the shell, which is pretty interesting. So yeah, these helmets were made from chrome, I'm gonna destroy this word, Molly B, Molly B Denim, so Molly B Denim steel, which is known like today as a 4100 series steel. So it's considered stronger than standard 1020 steel. But it's not easy to weld, and we'll get into that in a second, why this is pretty interesting and pretty relevant. For reference, uh, 4150 steel is authorized for use in the making of modern M16 or M4 barrels for the U.S. military. It's really strong stuff, but expensive and time-consuming uh, to produce these things. So that's probably why that you didn't see the big numbers until the late 1930s. That's just my opinion. That's not a fact. So uh, most are painted this like ochre or light brown color which gives it that distinctive appearance. There were covers that were made for these, but those are really expensive too. Maybe someday I'll do videos on that if I ever acquire them. But for now, we're just gonna talk about the actual shell itself. So yeah, it, that, that brown is what gives it a very distinctive appearance because I think that was the only helmet in the Second World War that was painted that color. You had a similar color to the Austro-Hungarian M1917 helmet in the First World War, but this one was painted this light brown color. So let's go take a look at the liner really quick. Now, I happen to get extremely lucky with this one, having such a nice liner and a really nice example of a liner. It, this is one of the nicer ones that you're going to actually see. Most of these Type 90 helmets have been used and abused, and um, you're going to find that they're in rough shape or missing the liner or both. So anyway, we've got a nice simple three-pad leather system right here, which each pad contains two um, t lobes or tongues or whatever you want to call it that have holes to secure the crown drawstring, which is pretty common. You can see that right there on this old style of liner. So there are also simple like pads, gauze pads. Here, let me try to show you behind the, the leather. So it's very similar to like a German M16 liner, and that was 
pretty much the standard on every helmet except the Brody and the Adrian helmet. Would is going to be at that time most of them are going to have this three pad system. Sorry about that. So yeah, um, buying the pads. Yep. Sorry, I already covered that. And the liner band itself is actually just leather. It's like an M16 band right there, and it's secured by three rivets. So you got one on the back right there. You got two right here on the back. And the third rivet is actually going to be that badge, which is really interesting, I thought. Um, and I, I don't know if it's it was designed like that on purpose or whatever, and I don't know why the Marine Corps ones have the anchor painted. I don't know what they used for holding the third rivet in. Maybe they had their own separate design. I don't know. But that definitely, it threads through. Let's see if I can lift this up and show you. Yep, it threads through. Uh, it's going to be tough. If you can see that split pin right in there. Yeah, there we go. That split pin is actually what goes through to the badge, which is super interesting. Now we'll get to the actually interesting part, which is the chin strap system. Now, if you already noticed, it's a little bit different than most chin straps of that time. It, first of all, um, it's a three-point system, which is probably the first widely adopted helmet to use one of these. And it consists of three riveted little brackets, which... You'll see right there, and those sets of rivets are on the outside, those little tiny rivets right there. So you'll notice that there's no welds on this helmet like there are in a lot of other helmets because this particular steel is not easy or you know efficient to weld in large numbers because of its strength and its properties. So it's very interesting. So these riveted brackets right here, as you can see, I'm trying to get the light. I'm struggling with the light on this one. Hold these rings right here, which, as you can see, they're kind of like a keychain ring. And then the chin strap threads through those. I believe this is a replacement chin strap or a late war chin strap. We'll get to that in a second, but uh, before you comment on that. And what was really interesting is uh, this is actually hemp rope or hemp cloth or whatever. It's, it's pretty heavy-duty stuff, but it's still soft enough to be comfortable. Um, and they thread through those little rings right there, and that's the actual system. Now, this was designed to release the chin strap, as you can see right there, in the event of like a, a blast or a nearby blast in order to prevent choking and or neck trauma. So, on this example too, you can tell there's a little strap that comes down in the back on the original ones, right? And this chin strap would be a little bit thicker like this and a little bit colored like that. Now, it leads me to believe this is an actual replacement chin strap, is the fact that this is a lot thinner, it's a lot lighter colored, and it's threaded directly through the ring. This guy was tucked in the back. Usually, you can see there's a hole there. Some of the chin strap was screwed and somebody replaced this at one point. Um, but usually, the, the chin strap itself would be threaded through the end right here, which is actually open, but it's not going to cooperate with me. And so it would be threaded through like this, so it would hang down a little bit farther on the rear ring. Um, so yeah, this, just, this example of the helmet doesn't have the original chin strap, but it's got an original chin strap, this is what I've surmised, which is also really hard to find on these. So yeah, now while this strap does seem like state-of-the-art kind of, there were drawbacks, one being the correct method of tying this chin strap. As you can see, it's kind of convoluted and there's some knots and stuff. It's not exactly the most simple thing to do, and it's a very complicated method of tying this and it was a complex system requiring a certain skill level to actually achieve um, the knots and to tie them correctly to secure them to the head. Another major drawback was the actual construction and design itself. Even if it was tied correctly, the strap system was quite unstable, causing problems when the soldiers were running. As you can see, I mean, this isn't even tied, but um, I, I don't know how to tie the knot currently. I'll try to research that because it's so complicated and it's weird. but than a future video and um so it, it becomes a problem when soldiers are running right so the helmet would often list to the side or you know fall down over the eyes and stuff which is a really big problem when you're attacking with bayonets uh now let's talk about why these are so hard to find especially in decent shape so the imperial japanese military was spread out over a vast area in southeast asia and the south pacific Making it from just north of Australia up to the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska to Manchuria and even to parts of India. They spread that far. They fully occupied many uh, entire nations until their defeat in 1945. And after the surrender, I'm going to try to line this guy back up. Oops. Oh, I just touched it. Yeah, I just totally did what I said I wasn't going to do. Anyway, <laughs> so 
Yeah, after the surrender, Japanese troops in these countries sometimes chose to just leave their, their arms and equipment and try to head home, or were otherwise forced to leave their equipment. This led to large stocks of Type 90 helmets, as well as other material and goods, being left over and subsequently used by other militaries for decades thereafter. Indochina is a great example of this. They can often be seen entire, outfitting entire units of Viet Minh, who were fighting against the French, with Japanese Type 90 helmets. Korea also used them in limited numbers, um, or South Korea as it would be, as well as Indonesia, China, Thailand, actually no, North Korea used them as well. So everybody in Korea was using them because the Japanese occupied Korea. Japanese army units just after World War II would wear the Type 90 only for a really brief period until a more American looking uniform with the addition of an M1 style helmet was produced. There, there's not a lot of these out there left really in decent shape simply because of having been used and for so long used and abused and a lot of them are melted down for the steel because it is good steel. An example in this condition will bring around a thousand US dollars right now in 2020. So that's how much these things are going for. Um, overall, it's a really cool design with a very neat history to it, but they're very hard to find. It has taken me 18 years to be, A, be able to afford one and B, be able to find one in this good a shape. So just take that into consideration. There's been some on the market and there's been some that were in this good a shape, but there's no way I could afford it. And um, with the help now of uh, Patreon supporters, I was able to afford this <laughs> mostly because, you know, I, I couldn't afford it out of pocket, but that really helped offset the cost. So if you'd like to support my work in the channel and allow me to get really cool stuff like this to make educational videos on, Patreon's a great way to do that. The link is in the description. It's a dollar a month. Five bucks a month or more gets into the Discord server, which is pretty fun. A lot of information is exchanged. They were watching live when I won this thing at an auction a few weeks ago, and everybody was pretty excited, so now I'm making the video. So that's a great way to support uh, the channel. And yeah, so 18 years, and with the help of Patreon, everything worked out to get one of these. So now it's a huge gap in the collection of World War II that's filled. Now all I need is, I think, a Danish M23 and a Dutch M34, and I will have a helmet from, I believe, every major player in the Second World War. So that's pretty cool. Thanks to my Patreon supporters, it's past and present. You guys rock. Um, and then thanks to everybody who's watching this. If you've got any questions on this, I'll try to answer. I'm not an expert really on anything, I'm kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. But helmets are my thing, so I can either point you in the right direction for information if you have questions, or I can probably try to answer them. But hopefully this answered a lot of your questions, so there's not a lot left to really ask. But anyway, thank you for watching so much, everybody. I really love this series and was so glad to be able to get this amazing, really rare and hard to find helmet in good shape. So thank you for watching, everybody, and we'll see you on the next episode of Helmets of the World.